So tonight's video is about community ecology. Remember, community is all of the living organisms in one particular area. So when we're talking about this community, we're talking about the bugs, the flowers, the bacteria, the animals, all the living things in that one particular uh, area. So the first thing with our community ecology, we're going to talk about interspecific interactions. And so these are any kind of interaction that's going to have an impact on the survival um, and or the reproduction of the species that you're talking about. Okay, so interspecific interactions have an impact on survival and reproduction of the species that are involved. And these are all hopefully review from your freshman year in middle school. Uh, for instance, over here on the side, you've got mutualism. Remember, mutualism is when both organisms benefit. Okay, they each get a benefit from the interaction. Okay, um, on the right here, you've got commensalism. Remember, with commensalism, one gets a benefit and the other one is neither helped nor harmed. Nothing is happening there. Mutualism, they both get a benefit. Commensalism, one gets a benefit, one is neither helped nor harmed. Down on the bottom, you have your parasitism. Remember, with parasitism, um, one is getting a benefit, one is actually getting harmed. So you have the parasite that's getting a benefit and the host that is being harmed. Some other types of interspecific interactions would be things like uh, predator-prey that you can see here. Um, just as a reminder, our predator is the one that's doing the eating. Uh, the prey is the one that's getting eaten. Um, some other types would be competition, whether you're competing for food, a mate, um, shelter. Okay, any type of competition has an impact on survival and reproduction of the species. Remember, that's what these interspecific um, reactions are, as well as uh, herbivory. Okay, that's an interaction. The plant eaters have an impact on the survival and reproduction of the plants that they are eating. And the plant availability has an impact on um, the survival of the uh, herbivores that are doing the eating. Okay, also just a quick reminder, remember all of these, these three right here from your freshman year, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism are all types of symbiosis. Remember, which is basically any kind of um, relationship that or organisms that live in close proximity to one another, the relationship that they have. Okay, so again, all of these are interspecific react, um, interactions that are affecting survival and reproduction. So now we're going to shift over to the structure of the community, and we're going to look at some different aspects of it. Um, the first one, again, just a reminder of what the community is. Remember, it's all those populations that live close enough together to interact. So they are in close proximity, they're in the same area, they're having those interspecific interactions that we talked about just a minute ago. Okay, so some of the particular parts of the community involve, first of all, what's called the dominant species. So the dominant species is going to be the one that is the most abundant. Okay, so there's the largest number of these. Okay, so that's it may not be the most important species in the community, but it has the highest number. Okay, so they are the most abundant. It has the highest biomass. Remember, that's the um, actual mass. If you took all of the or all of those particular organisms together and you took their mass, so it has the highest biomass. Okay, and it does have control over other species. And then um, the control that it has is occurrence of the species. Because, you know, there are so many of these organisms that they uh, may not allow certain species to grow in a certain area. They may take more resources, so another species doesn't do as well. So these have a large impact on um, the other species in the community, both their occurrence and their distribution. For example, um, what we have here, this um, oak tree here, is a dominant species. So this is a big, large tree that is going to have an impact over the distribution of the other species, where they're, uh, where other trees are able to grow, um, distribution of the birds, the insects. So that would be considered a dominant species. Okay, it's dominant because, as a general rule, 
It's better at using resources or it's more successful at involving a predator, but it has something going for it that essentially gives it a little bit of an edge over the other organisms. Again, it could be a better in its competition for resources. It could be better at avoiding um, being eaten. Okay? It just, um, that can vary from dominant species to dominant species. Okay? And not, the next one is our keystone species. The keystone species is not necessarily the most abundant. Okay? It does not have to be the species with the highest number. Okay. What it does, though, is it has a major influence on the ecosystem due just to its ecological niche, not necessarily due to its numbers like the dominant species does, but due to its actual, due to what it does for the community. That's what um, the ecological niche is, is their role or function in the community. And so, for example, the sea otter is a keystone species. Its role in the community has a major impact on the urchin population, okay, which then has an impact on the kelp population. And so when you remove the sea otters, the sea urchin population grows out of control and then it eats up all the kelp. And that actually turns out to be bad for the sea urchins because now they don't have any food to eat. So the sea otter being example of a keystone species. Not the most abundant, they don't have the largest number, but they have a very, very strong influence and control because of their role. Some other things that we look at when we're looking at the community structure uh, would be species richness. Okay? The species richness is the number of species and their abundance. How many um, of them are there okay? and how populous are they? For example, if you look at these two communities here, okay, hopefully you realize the one on the left is more species rich. Um, it's got a, a larger number of species in abundance within the ecosystem there. Biodiversity is also important in the community. Okay? Biodiversity is the, um, is the variety of species, the variety of organisms that are there. Um, an increase in biodiversity is a good thing. We like that. Okay, it makes the community more productive. It makes it more stable. The wide variety of organisms is better ecologically. It makes the um, community better able to recover from some, from some kind of stress. Large storm, fire, it makes it more likely that some kind of organism was able to survive whatever the stress was. Okay, so it's able to recover, respond to stress better, withstand stress better, okay, and they'll be more um, resistant to invasive species. Remember, those invasive species are the ones that come in, they have no natural predators, um, they usually outcompete the native species, and they kind of take over. You know, we had the snakes, we had the kudzu. Um, and so the more biodiverse the ecosystem is, or the community is, the more resistant it can be to those um, invasive species. Okay? When we're looking at a community, we may look at what we call species diversity. Okay? Species diversity. And the species diversity, I know I'm writing over this, the species diversity is its richness, okay? so it's richness plus its abundance. So the number of the different species, okay, so the number of different species plus their relative abundance. So as you're looking at the, basically you're looking at the proportions of each of the different species. Okay, so species diversity, again, is your species richness. So your number of different species plus your relative abundance, basically your proportions of these different ones. If you look at this table on the side here and you look at the communities, um, hopefully you could at first, you know, at glance to see which one is the most diverse. And you're going to get community A as your most diverse community. Okay? It has the species richness. Okay? It's got the largest different number of species. It's got all five species in it. Community B only has four. Community C only has two. Okay, and it has uh, the relative proportions of them are pretty even here. 
Okay, and so that that would be our most diverse, uh, most stable um, community. Okay, so let's apply now this keystone species um, idea to species richness, species abundance, really take a look at what it does to the ecosystem. So we're going to work with sea otters again. So um, when I, our food, ch our short little food chain in this particular community okay, is going to start here with the kelp. Let me put a color you can actually see. You can see the kelp there blowing in the current. Okay, and the kelp is eaten by the sea urchins. So these spiny things here are your sea urchins. That's an R. Okay, and then the sea urchins are eaten by the sea otter here. Okay, so that's our short little food chain in this particular community. Remember, our sea otters are keystone species. So if we remove the keystone species, we're going to get a decrease in that species richness. Okay, remember, the species richness is our number of different species that we have there. So if I'm going to remove my keystone species, that species richness is going to go down. Remember, as we lose that diversity, then we are um, impacting the potential stability of our ecosystem. And the problem we have here is that in this particular instance, the sea otter population is declining because of an increase in orca um, predation. So um, an orca is a killer whale, and so the sea otters are being eaten by the orcas. So the sea otter population is going down because, again, the orcas are preying on the sea otter population. So this is having an impact on our keystone species population. This has such an impact because the sea otters and the kelp have a, a close relationship. Even though the sea otter doesn't eat the kelp and directly interact with the kelp, the sea otters, like we mentioned before, keeps the sea urchin population in control. And when it keeps that sea urchin population in control, the kelp forest is able to survive. Okay? And the kelp so um, forest provides resources to multiple other organisms. But if that sea urchin population gets out of control, then the kelp forest can no longer survive. And that impacts more than just the sea urchin that's eating the kelp. The reason why the orca population is just now starting to eat the sea otters okay, is, as um, unfortunately most of the instances with these ecological shifts, is a human impact story. Okay, so your sea, your orcas, your killer whales, used to um, or normally eat uh, seals, sea lions, other type of fish. Some of them eat salmon. Um, unfortunately, most of the organisms that they usually eat have been overfished and hunted. And so their populations have gone down dramatically. So the orca or the killer whale has had to find a different and alternative food source. And so its alternative food source has become the sea otter. And so the orca has been eating the sea otter uh, for the past few years to supplement um, the lack of seals and other, other fish, sea lions. You can see on the graph here, okay, you can see what's happening as this shifts. Okay, so in, uh, when they first did this in around 1986, okay, when they took kelp density, okay, you can see it was nice and high. A sea urchin biomass was pretty low, and the sea otter abundance was pretty high. But then, in ten years, just ten short years later, after the killer whales had started eating the sea otters, you can see how much lower the kelp forest um, has decreased significantly. The urchin population has more than tripled. And your sea, uh, sea otter population has diminished drastically. So you can see the impact that losing this keystone species is having on these other, on the rest of the community. Okay, so let's try to quantify this a little bit. You know, we've been talking, I've been telling you how we're going to be doing a lot of math. And let's see how we can do some math and quantify this a little bit. Okay, so let's first start with the uh, we're going to start with male versus a female orca. Okay, so a male orca, its calorie requirements are about 308,000 kilocalories per day. 
where uh, females are about 